The first experiments with diet were done back years ago. Dr. Sweeney in 1928 took some 20-year-old medical students and he put them on three different programs for just 48 hours. He put them on a very high carbohydrate diet, a very high fat diet, and then a third group, he gave them nothing except water to drink. At the end of 48 hours, he tested them with the glucose tolerance test. Now, you know, that's the test that we use to diagnose diabetes. The test simply consists of giving you about three ounces of glucose, that's a simple sugar like corn syrup, and a glass of water. And we take a blood test before you take the drink, and then every half hour for a couple of hours afterwards. And by seeing what happens in your bloodstream, we can tell you if you test diabetic. It's arbitrary. If your blood sugar upon fasting is higher than 115 milligrams of glucose for roughly three ounces of blood, you're abnormal. If at any time it rises above 170 milligrams percent, during the two-hour period, you're abnormal too. And if after two hours it doesn't return below 115 milligrams of glucose, you're also abnormal. So we have three ways to determine if you're abnormal, and if you are, then we have to classify you as diabetic. Well, Dr. Sweeney tested his young man 48 hours after this diet. The high-carbohydrate diet, which incidentally had honey, sugar, molasses, potatoes, corn, and so on in it, they were perfectly normal, no problems at all. On the high fat diet, which had mayonnaise, eggs, butter, cream, and so on, everyone tested severely diabetic. That was a surprise. How about those having nothing at all? They tested just as severely diabetic as those who are on a very high fat diet. Well, how can that be if all they had was water? Well, when you're on a total fast like that, in the first 12 hours, the body uses up all of its blood glucose. That's the only store you have. And after that, the calories you require come from your fat reserves. So by 48 hours, the blood was so high in fat from your own fat reserves that there was just as much fat in the blood as there was on the high-fat diet. So it doesn't seem to make any difference whether it's your fat or the fat from the food that you eat. If you have high fat in the blood, somehow you will develop an abnormal glucose tolerance test. Now, Dr. Felber decided to see what happens when you take normal young men who have a normal glucose tolerance test and simply infuse some fat into their blood equivalent to what they normally would have 12 hours after they get up. Because everybody is on a 12-hour clock. For example, when you wake up in the morning, your temperature is at the lowest. It might be 97, might be 97.5, 98. 12 hours later, it's a point higher. A degree higher, maybe a degree and a half higher. And then 12 hours after that, at 6 a.m. in the morning, it's back to the low, and it cycles every 12 hours. Well, the free fatty acids in your body cycle too. These are the fats that keep on exchanging from your fat reserves into the blood. They come from your fat reserves into the blood, go back in the fat reserves, all the time they're cycling. And in the morning, it's the lowest. 12 hours later, it's 30 to 50% higher. So all Dr. Felber did was to put fat into their blood equivalent to where it would have been by nature in late afternoon. He was amazed to find that a little bit of fat was enough to give them a diabetic glucose tolerance test. And he checked out their insulin. He said, well, maybe the fat I put in stopped the pancreas from making insulin. But no, the insulin was even 50% higher than it was when they were tested without the fat. So the body tried to make more insulin to overcome the extra glucose rising, but it couldn't control it. Dr. James Anderson, who was chief of endocrinology at the University of Kentucky Medical School, did a two-week test with his 20-year-old young normal man. And he gave them formula diets. For example, he gave them a diet made of corn oil, 5% corn oil a diet, 80% carbohydrates, table sugar, and 15% protein, protein which was primarily dry curd cottage cheese. Now when I say 80% carbohydrates of table sugar, I mean the pound of table sugar a day these young men had. He gave them another diet of only 20% carbohydrate and 65% fat. After two weeks' time, all those on the 65% fat diet, remember the American diet is 43% fat, on the 65% fat diet, they all tested diabetic. On the 5% fat diet, but a pound of table sugar a day, they all tested perfectly normal.
I thought that sugar has something to do with diabetes. Why aren't these young men diabetic then? Well, he decided to carry this further. He took these young men who are on a pound of table sugar a day and continued it for another nine weeks. That's 11 weeks total, almost three months on a pound of table sugar a day. Yet at the end of that period, the young men tested perfectly normal. No problems at all. That teaches us whether or not sugar is a factor in creating diabetes or fat. Because as Dr. Felber has seen, only two hours of putting fat into the blood, they test diabetic. And Dr. Anders has seen three months of putting people on the pound of table sugar a day, and they're perfectly normal. Well, after a period of time, other investigators tried to understand what was happening, one of which was Dr. Hemsworth of England. Dr. Hemsworth of England taking up on these studies, and he did this incidentally in 1935, because the earliest works done on testing carbohydrate intolerance and so on for diabetics was done in the 20s and the 30s. When insulin first came in, they were able to experiment. And Dr. Hemsworth found that if he took young men and put them on a high-fat diet for a week, Every single time he did that, they test diabetic on a glucose tolerance test. And every time he took the same young men and put them on a low-fat diet for a week, without exception, they would test normal. And he decided to test it. He says, you know, it may be that the high fat paralyzes the body's insulin. In those days, they couldn't measure insulin too accurately. So he said, I'm going to inject insulin into them. We won't use the body's insulin. We won't give a glucose tolerance test. What we'll do is I'll simply inject insulin into them out of a syringe like we give to diabetics, and we'll see if that lowers, burns up their glucose for them. And so he put them on a very high fat diet, and he gave them a certain amount of insulin, three units of insulin, which is very insignificant, a very tiny amount. And the three units used up a certain amount of glucose on the high fat diet. Then he put the same in on a low fat diet and gave them the same amount of insulin from the same syringe measured the amount of glucose that it used up, and he was amazed to find that it, it used up 400% more glucose than when their blood had high fat in, than when it had low fat. Dr. Hemsworth was the first man, the first investigator, to really find out what fat does to insulin. In his test, he showed that <clears throat> it didn't make any difference <clears throat> whether it was <clears throat> your insulin or insulin that injects in a syringe. If you have high fat in your blood, the insulin cannot burn up the glucose. In those days, it wasn't understood why fat insensitized insulin. It sort of paralyzed insulin. It wasn't understood at all, but we understand now because recent findings teach us this, that every cell, if you can picture a cell as a little round room, and if you can picture in this little round room, there might be a hundred doors all around the boundaries, the circumference of this little room. And these little hundred doors are what we call sites, S-I-T-E-S. They're sort of areas where things cling to. And if you can say that out of these hundred doors, 20 of them belong to insulin. And insulin just sits at the door, and when glucose wants to come into the cell to be used for fuel, the, gluco the insulin opens the door and the glucose comes in. Now that's fine, but what if what happens, a very artificial thing happens, that instead of the insulin guiding the door, that the fat somehow becomes magnetized to the door, and when you get a certain amount of fat in your blood, when it reaches over a certain amount, the fat will preferentially get to those little doors and not let the insulin get to the doors. And the fat doesn't let the doors open when the glucose wants to come in. So all those doors stay closed, and the insulin can't get to it because the fat is blocking the way. When we take the fat out of your diet, the fat disappears from the doors, the insulin comes back and opens the doors and lets the glucose come in. And that's more or less the mechanism. The fat binds to these insulin binding sites in the cell and deprives the insulin <coughs> of being able to do their work. That's why when we take fat out of the diet of adult onset diabetic, in almost most cases, within three, four weeks, we're able to get rid of his extra insulin uh, that he injects through a syringe. And we've had diabetics on 180 units of insulin that we've gotten them off of within three or four weeks, and they have normal blood sugar values. Well, now that we understand a little bit about the role of fat in diabetes, what do we do about it? Well, that's the big problem because the American Diabetic Association dietary recommendations for 50 years have been simply 
don't use carbohydrates. Limit them. Limit them tremendously. And if you limit carbohydrates, you've got to use something else. And so fats are what we use. The American Diabetic Association diet used to have 55 to 60 percent of its total calories in fat, far more than we're even using for the average American diet. And it's taken a lot of work to get them to change that recommendation. In fact, I personally feel that the recommendations of the American Diabetic Association diet were one of the principal factors that can continued diabetic to continue to have diabetes in our country. It was the principal factor for the continuation of adult onset diabetes in our country, the high fat recommendations. Now, Dr. Anderson, about five years ago, because of his interest in high carbohydrate diets, uh, and I got together and I presented my dietary approach to him. And he, although he had never tried a diet like this, uh, of natural foods, high in carbohydrates, he's willing to try the diet if I could raise some funds for him so they can hire a uh, PhD to run his program. And I raised $10,000 for him and he started his program about five years ago. He was so successful in this program, he's getting exactly the same success as we get at our center in getting diabetics off insulin, and that he's published very widely, and his writings now have influenced the American Diabetic Association for the first time in 50 years to make a major change in their dietetic recommendations. And the major change is that don't be afraid of carbohydrates anymore. New findings have taught us that you can have up to 60% of your total calories in carbohydrates. Now well, that brings fat way down. And many, many uh, physicians that treat diabetics are a little astounded at this, and they might be a little frightened in using these new recommendations because they're so different. But I hope that it catches on, and in time that the American Diabetic Association will recommend the most effective diet that Dr. Anderson has tested, and that is our diet, where carbohydrates are above 70% of total calories. But they've made a good step forward. And it's taken a lot of time to do it. In fact, when Dr. Kelly M. West, who is professor of medicine specializing in diabetes of the University of Oklahoma Medical School, appeared recently before the Senate hearings on nutrition, he said one of the most exciting new researches in diabetic therapy is the high carbohydrate, low fat diet that Dr. Anderson is using. He said if this diet were used universally in our country, two thirds of all the millions of diabetics would be off all the drugs completely. Well, that's quite a strong statement. It'd be nice to have six or seven million people who are not diabetic on the various drugs, off their drugs completely, no more having to stick themselves with a needle. We've had diabetics who have been on insulin sticking themselves with a needle every day for 20 years, off insulin completely now. And there's no reason why the whole country shouldn't have this advantage.